Thank you for joining us. Healthcare is a more important topic than ever, and factors include the rising costs in hospitals and goods and services. This is in addition to the costs of medical professionals, equipment, medicines and information systems, and other factors are the rising demand for cost and compliance with regulatory requirements. However, there is a free market solution to today's artificially inflated healthcare costs and Congress can amend the law to allow free market forces to drive down the costs and enable the prevention of diseases and the development of improved medical therapies. An example of this is implemented by Dr. Todd Jackson, president of the Prestige Laser and Cataract Institute in Las Vegas, where he and his colleagues are significantly improving healthcare with experience, professionalism, and compassion using the latest in state-of-the-art ophthalmic technology. Dr. Jackson will share his views on this following these messages. Healthcare costs are bankrupting America. The cause is federal overregulation. Unless a free market is restored, no one, including government, business, or individuals, will be able to afford the high cost of health care. My new book, Pharmocracy, exposes the corruption that causes needless suffering and death while our nation sinks into financial ruin. The solutions in this book can save Medicare and improve the lives of aging Americans. Pharmocracy provides an irrefutable basis to stop the suffocating impact of health care regulation. The benefit will be better medical technology at far lower prices. Fight back against corruption. Pharmocracy shows how we can tear down bureaucratic barriers that push health care costs beyond the reach of the American people. We can do it. This essential book is only $24, and you'll also receive a free subscription to Life Extension magazine. Get your book today. With us now is Dr. Todd Jackson. Dr. Jackson, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, if I may call you Todd. Absolutely. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, Richard. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, in your area, your area of specialty, which is vision, and of course, healthcare is a great concern um, today more than ever. What's happening in your area of specialty? Ophthalmology is always and always has been at the forefront of developing innovations to help increase um, the well-being of, their, of our patients. Uh, currently, and this is a difficult question because there's so much that's adding to it. From the standpoint of cataract surgery, lenses have been developed that help people see distance, intermediate, and near. There are technologies that are helping us as surgeons to be more precise and optimizing our surgeries to help produce the best visual outcomes for patients. There are new technologies that help to correct astigmatism. So in the world of ophthalmology, there are many things that are happening, both from cataract, glaucoma, screening for diabetic retinopathy and other sight-threatening diseases. It's a very exciting time to be in the field of ophthalmology. How much is being spent on cataract surgery in general in the United States? Richard, it's interesting that you ask that question because cataract surgery is the most common surgical procedure of the Medicare population. Approximately 3.2 million cataracts are removed each year at a cost of $4.7 billion to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Todd, I've done interviews with the Life Extension Foundation and they are very much in the forefront of concerns regarding the possible insolvency of Medicare. You're right. I spoke earlier with Bill Falloon and we talked about the insolvency of the Medicare and Medicaid system and everyone would agree that something dramatic needs to be done. And the question becomes, well, are there viable solutions? because there's multiple issues facing America. One is the potential insolvency of our Medicare system and Medicaid system. Another is a potential shortage of physicians. The third is how innovation is being developed outside of the U.S. and that the U.S. is lagging behind in innovation. And 
the question then becomes, well, is there a viable solution to help us to save, from an economic standpoint, Medicare and Medicaid, to develop a system that promotes having the best physicians in the world, and three, puts U.S. back at the forefront of innovation in the healthcare system. And through ophthalmology and some of the projects that we've been working on, we have helped to come up with a solution or a potential solution for this. May I go into some of the details of that? Project? Please, please do so. Interestingly, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in March of 2010, there was a portion of that act which was which which established the CMS Innovation Center, or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center. The Innovation Center has the mission of finding and funding demonstrations and projects that save money without reducing quality. And what was unique about this particular legislation and this center is that they have the ability to implement those projects that have been demonstrated to save money without reducing quality. And so what we discovered as at Prestige Laser and Cataract Institute in Las Vegas, when I founded the company, one of the, our core principles is to give back. And 2% uh, right off the top, we give back to the poor. 1% locally and 1% internationally. And what we soon discovered that there were approximately 30,000 individuals in Las Vegas that needed sight restoring or sight saving surgery. And in collaboration with some of the surgeons that I work with, we sat down and said, you know, cataract surgery could be done safely and effectively for many patients in a more cost effective setting. So we developed the first fully accredited office based cataract surgery suite in Nevada. And in the process of doing that, we discovered that we could reduce the price of cataract surgery anywhere from 74% to 24% and reduce the price of that procedure to the Medicare population out of pocket expense by 34%. On a national scale, what implication would that have with regard to the entire picture nationwide? <clears throat> it has a huge implication. Because if you can demonstrate that you can save Medicare $1.3 billion per year on the most common surgical procedure of the Medicare population, and then those same principles could be applied to the other dozen or so surgical subspecialties, the saving is approximately $550 billion. And those same principles, if applied to all outpatient care, the savings could be around $2 trillion. And it's not just about having the procedures done in a cost-effective setting. The essence of the project is put the physicians in the leadership seat as it pertains to finding cost-saving measures. Think about it this way, Richard. Who should be the one who should drive the innovation as it pertains to efficient cost-saving measures? Who should be the one who comes up with those ideas. Let me tell you who I think it should be. It should be the individuals who have the most knowledge with regards to the medical procedures, most knowledge with regards to the diagnosis, the most knowledge with regards to the patients that they are caring for, and those individuals who have taken an oath and are accountable both ethically, morally, and legally to the patient. It's the more than 633,000 physicians who practice in the United States give them the power to save money, incentivize them appropriately to find ways to increase the efficiency of our system. And doing cataract surgery in a more cost-effective setting is just one example of how we could save up to 74%. Currently, uh, SGR is around 27%. SGR stands for the amount of money that uh, the government needs to save on, <clears throat> on any, basically reducing across the board all physicians' reimbursements by 27%.
which they keep having to fix every year called the doctor fix. But rather than just putting a Band-Aid on it, implementing physician-led, value-based medicine gives you the tools to be able to save trillions of dollars, increase the number of physicians, increase access to patients, increase accessibility, drive innovation, and let America lead the rest of the world as it pertains to the most advanced medical procedures and the most efficient and high quality medical system. Now you've presented your ideas uh, to different groups, um, the establishment in general, to politicians and so forth. How are your ideas being received or implemented? On a federal level, the, the ideas are received generally very well. It's interesting in working with uh, government institutions, those individuals who are working in those government institutions, their heart is in the right place. We want to be able to save money for the American people, but the system can be very cumbersome. And it's actually amazing to me when I present these ideas how slow and cumbersome the system really can be. These terms you're mentioning remind me of the challenges that, for example, the Life Extension Foundation has faced for many years, being a world leader in research in their fields, and a lot of, uh, I would say, lack of cooperation they've received. Are you also subjected to such, perhaps, lack of cooperation from the FDA and so forth? At this point, I haven't uh, talked with the FDA, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, they have been good. They have talked with me. Um, I've gone out to Washington, D.C., presented the ideas. For the most part, they've been very cooperative, and I'm, am, and I'm happy to see that. The Senator's offices and the House of Representatives' offices and their constituents have sat down with me and heard the project, and I'm pleased that they have, but the importance of this project is such that I don't want to let it lie. I want to be sure that, uh, that everyone knows about it, that, that we have the opportunity, and that it's not just my project, to collaborate with legislators, industry, and our profession to be able to, sure, to, be able to make sure that we make a demonstration that has everyone on board. Um, I have no monopoly on intelligence or monopoly on great ideas. By collaborating with all these individuals, government, industry, physicians, that's the way we can come up with real solutions to real problems. And the exciting part is we've actually demonstrated it already, the cost savings that you can drive by putting the physician in the driver's seat and letting us help to implement value-based health care. Value-based health care is being able to, the insurance company should be able to pay you for outcomes, not just services. And value is coupling quality with cost. And the only way that you're going to get that and transparency of information is getting the physicians on board. This is all very important, and I'd like to ask you, how can these changes be implemented? The wonderful thing is, is we do have a way that they can be implemented. The Affordable Care Act gave power to CMS's Innovation Center to be able to fund demonstrations. A demonstration, in essence, is an opportunity for an organization or a physician or a group of physicians to put together an idea that saves money without reducing quality. CMS then gives them the opportunity to demonstrate that in fact they can do that. And so in order to implement this process we can work with the Innovation Center, demonstrate the efficacy of doing cataract surgery not all cataract surgery, but a large majority of cataract surgery in a safe office space setting. Once that's done, then those same principles can be applied to the other surgical subspecialties. 
once that is accomplished, those same principles can be applied to all outpatient services. And those principles are physician-led, value-based purchasing of healthcare. So what would be the next step? Well, there's two next steps that can occur. One is uh, my foundation and corporation works together with private insurers to help demonstrate the cost effectiveness of doing uh, these procedures in more cost efficient settings. The other step could be doing a demonstration with the support and funding of the centers of Medicare and Medicaid. There are certain studies that still need to be done with regards to the safety and efficacy of these procedures because we always want the safety of the patient to be number one. Richard, the exciting part about this whole demonstration is that many of the tools necessary to implement this project already exist. And some of these tools are, are the following. One is the concept of compensating physicians based on cost-saving measures. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have implemented ACOs, which stands for Accountable Care Organizations. One of the principles of accountable care organizations is compensating those health care providers who are saving money. Another principle is the electronic medical record. If we want to go to a system where we are paying for outcomes rather than just services, you need to be able to know what the outcome is and how much it costs. And the electronic medical record, which has been implemented over the past several years and continues to be implemented, is a key factor in developing a value-based system. So here are two key components that already exist. The Office of the Inspector General has already looked at some of these instances of helping to align physician incentives to incentivize those physicians who save money without reducing quality. And so in order to implement this project, no new organization needs to be formed, no additional tax dollars need to be spent. The tools are there. We just need to put them in alignment and use them to save the money, decrease the price, maintain the quality, increase access to the patient. And billions of dollars would be saved? Trillions of dollars would be saved. Most immediately in cataract surgery, yes, it's billions of dollars. But those same principles apply to the other surgical subspecialties and outpatient care, the numbers are staggering. And you, you think about you know, who should be in charge of saving that money. Is it the insurance companies or the hospitals? No, put it in the hands of the physicians, those who touch the patients, touch their lives, and they can help direct evidence-based medicine that can enhance their medical experience. Well, intelligent innovation is so crucial, and progress is such an inspiring, wonderful thing, whether it is here in the United States or elsewhere. For example, I think you mentioned that you're aware of the fact that uh, in Israel there's a lot of research and development in the area of ophthalmology. Could you share some of that with us? The state of Israel has been fundamental and key in advancing technologies as it pertains to eye care. I remember in my residency program working with a fellow from Israel, one of the finest men that I've ever had the opportunity to work with, who is advancing the boundaries of knowledge as it pertains to eye care and eye health. And it's nations working together, professionals working together to help solve these issues and help enhance the lives of individuals. Eye care or cataract surgery enhances um, one's lifestyle. It's been, it's been proven to reduce the amount of hip fractures. It's been proven to help individuals to drive safer, to have a better quality of life. Research is being done in Israel with regards to new lenses that could go in the eye after cataract surgery that allow people to see both distance, intermediate, and near, and to help restore some of the accommodation that is lost naturally over time. This is all very interesting, and considering that you're advocating more uh, outpatient treatment and surgeries. What are your thoughts with regard to safety? We've also been working with the Institute for Safe Office-Based Surgery, which is headed by and founded by Dr. Fred Shapiro and Rich Ehrman from Harvard University. They have 
developed a office-based surgery safety checklist that has been shown to help to reduce complications and enhance safety in an office-based setting. In addition, they recently developed a patient safety checklist that is currently being implemented across the country to help ensure that office-based surgeries are done in a safe and effective way. We talked earlier about what the next step is. What happens if CMS funds the research or if they don't? This idea and concept is so important to me that regardless of what the government does, we've decided to put together a corporation called Prestige Consultants. And the mission of Prestige Consultants is to implement safe office-based surgery across the country. This organization is set up to help physicians to implement safe and effective office-based surgery. Todd, this has been most interesting. I want to wish you a lot of success with this very important work you're doing, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Richard. I'll be right back. Welcome to Rambam Healthcare Campus, where medicine, technology, and humanity intertwine to bring exemplary medical care, research, development, and education to the benefit of people worldwide. The teachings of the great rabbi physician Rambam, the Maimonides, are a daily inspiration here. Hence, a spirit of diversity and coexistence is at the heart of our work ethic. Rambam is a 1,000-bed academic hospital serving over 2 million people in northern Israel. Strategically located in Haifa on the Mediterranean coast, it is the tertiary referral center for 12 district hospitals and defense and peacekeeping forces in the region. Wartime experience has made Rambam Healthcare Campus the exclusive comprehensive trauma treatment provider in northern Israel and a world leader in mass trauma and casualty education. Treating more trauma victims than any other hospital in Israel, Rambam's percentage of trauma survivors is the highest in the nation. Our academic and industrial collaborations contribute to a rich and fertile ground for progress, development, and success in the medical sciences. Collaboration and sharing of expertise is key to Rambam's achievements, optimizing clinical outcomes in the provision of individualized healthcare. The Technion's Ruth and Bruce Rappaport Faculty of Medicine and the Rappaport Family Institute for Research in the Medical Sciences and Rambam are located on one campus. Rambam, together with these two institutions and academic affiliation with the Technion, along with world-class health technology partners, brings science to life. Working with given imaging to develop the PillCam for diagnosing gastrointestinal diseases, Working with GE Global Healthcare to develop dedicated cardiac spec CT as part of the diagnostic process for coronary heart disease. Using stem cells to test the effects and effectiveness of new pharmaceuticals for tailored medicine. Using gene mapping for early detection of hereditary diseases such as diabetes and kidney failure or dysfunction. Creating a cancer vaccine as part of a U.S.-Israel research effort, if successful, this vaccine will change cancer therapy as we know it. All of these projects and more are Rambam's legacy to bring new hope to research-driven healthcare. Rambam Healthcare Campus is undergoing the largest expansion of any hospital in Israel. 
with five new facilities to house innovative medical treatment centers and advanced teaching and research facilities. This concludes our special show for today from On Location in Boston. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Thank mm -hmm. you.